Wouldn't it be nice if you could just eat whatever you wanted to for the rest of your life? Well, you can, but it may just be a very short and painful life. But when it comes to nutrition, I normally believe that most everything has a place, and that you are in complete control of the health versus pleasure dynamic. Just because some foods are suboptimal doesn't mean they're detrimental, and it's perfectly fine for your enjoyment, preferences, and personal views to influence your consumption decisions. That being said, there are some lines that are best left uncrossed. Some lines where that health versus pleasure trade-off just isn't worth it. And those lines have been blurred to the general population for far too long. Whether it be because of a lack of understanding or genuine deceit, it's time to bring to light the real killers. Yeah, trans fats are kind of the worst. But in order to understand why, you need to have a base knowledge of fats in general. Fats are a type of macronutrient essential for optimal bodily development and function that provides 9 calories compared to the 4 in carbohydrates and protein. Certain fatty acids the body cannot make on its own, thus they must be consumed. Fats are most often associated with the benefits of aiding in the absorption of fat-soluble vitamins, notably vitamins A, D, E, and K and the supportive roles it plays maintaining brain and nerve efficiency. But they're also used to regulate cholesterol and blood pressure, provide energy, and probably most importantly make up the majority of cell membranes. There are two main types of fat, saturated and unsaturated, and I'm going to get a little sciency here, but I do believe it's necessary. Saturated fats are defined by having no double bonds, meaning that in their chemical structure, every carbon atom is fully bound to hydrogen atoms, making them straight and compact, and as a result, usually solid at room temperature. And as I mentioned earlier with cell membranes, too much saturated fat would make these membranes rigid, impairing cellular transmission and response. Saturated fat has a long and complicated history, often associated with cholesterol and heart issues, especially in excess. However, some saturated fat is shown to be necessary for optimal brain and nervous function and the preservation of your heart, liver, bones, and immune health, again, in controlled quantities. That being said, not all saturated fats are created equally, as it has been shown that fatty acid chain lengths have a lot to do with cholesterol. Saturated fats are definitely the yellow light of the fat world, but I can't get myself to call them a killer. Now, unsaturated fats are more like the green light of the fat world. They're defined by containing at least one double bond, meaning that not all their carbon atoms have hydrogen atoms to bind with, thus the carbon atoms bind to each other, creating a kink in the structure. These kinks create gaps between molecules, making them less compact and often liquid at room temperature. And these kinks also allow for more fluidity through cell membranes. Now there's plenty of evidence to support that unsaturated fats are beneficial for cholesterol and heart health, fighting inflammation, and again playing a key role in optimal brain and nervous function. Both saturated and unsaturated fats are needed for something called myelin, basically the neuron insulator that wraps around neurons and speeds up electrical signal conduction. And going even further, there's two main types of unsaturated fats, monounsaturated and polyunsaturated, with the difference being poly having more than one double bond, thus more kinks. These kinks are essential to the benefits of unsaturated fats, so what would happen if we were to alter them? Trans fats happen, the red light of the fat world. They very rarely occur naturally and are usually made through a process called hydrogenation. This is a manufacturing process that adds hydrogen to unsaturated fats, usually in vegetable oil that changes their structure. The double bond is still present, but trans fats lose that all essential kink, making them more balanced and rigid like saturated fats, resulting in the semi-solid state you'll find in foods like margarine. The problem is that your body doesn't typically break down trans fats as well, as we lack the enzymes to do so. Trans fats are consistently shown to increase LDL cholesterol and decrease HDL cholesterol. To put it as simply as possible, LDL is used to deliver cholesterol throughout the body, while HDL is used to carry it back to the liver. A balanced ratio is required between these two, with most people needing to make an active effort to raise HDL levels and lower LDL levels. Trans fats simply don't do this. Too high of LDL can build up what's called plaque on the walls of your blood vessels. Thus, trans fats are shown to significantly increase risks of heart disease, stroke, and type 2 diabetes. In fact, trans fats are so bad that the FDA has banned them, prohibiting manufacturers from using them, but this hasn't solved everything. First off, some products from before the ban still have some. And, at least in the US, products with less than half a gram of trans fats in a single serving can get away with saying zero grams, and this can add up very quickly. Now, let me be clear, trans fats are not nearly as much of an issue as they were, say, five years ago, but manufacturers will always try to find loopholes to use trans fats. You may be asking why. Money! It's almost always money. Companies use trans fats because they are less expensive, have a longer shelf life, and often give a more desirable taste and texture. 
And while the states have historically been the worst abusers of trans fats, in the modern era many other countries do not have as many regulations for them, so they could start using them without you even really knowing. How we got to this point I honestly find fascinating, because trans fats have a surprisingly young and uncomfortably ongoing history. The synthesis of hydrogenated compounds started in the 1890s, when French chemist Paul Sabatier discovered that metal catalysts could be used to precipitate hydrogenation reactions. In 1901, German chemist Wilhelm Norman was experimenting with hydrogenation catalysts and successfully added hydrogen to liquid fat, creating the first semi-solid trans fat. Now by then, it had already been established that unsaturated fats were generally healthy but susceptible to a shorter shelf life, and a simple change from normal unsaturated fats to trans fats would go a long way in remedying this. But also at the time, people were very open to switch their cooking fats from the full of saturated fat, butter and lard, to the quote-unquote healthy vegetable oil. At the time, it all made sense. In 1911, the first product to contain trans fats hit the shelves, Crisco Vegetable Shortening, which used cottonseed oil that had been hydrogenized to become semi-solid at room temperature. This product took off due to price and apparently a cookbook whose recipes required Crisco shortening. By the 1920s, many baking companies started making the switch in a lot of their products, breads, pies, cakes, and so on. And hydrogenation took a big step in becoming widely accepted around World War II, when margarine started being used in place of butter, when butter started being rationed. By the 1960s, it was estimated that processed vegetable oils were more widely used than animal fats. It wasn't until the late 80s that people started to clue in and notice an association between trans fats and heart disease. Apparently before then, not much was known about trans fats in regards to health, as not many studies were done. It seemed like most people just assumed, well, they're unsaturated fats, they must be healthy. In 1993, Harvard conducted a study that links trans fats to a greater risk of heart attack, and they found that by replacing just 2% of calories from trans fats to unsaturated fats reduced the risk of heart disease by about 30%. By that time, trans fats were estimated to make up anywhere from 2 to 8% of a typical American diet. On July 11, 2003, the FDA amended regulations to state that trans fats must be included on nutrition labels. The rule came into effect in 2006. That same year, KFC got in a lawsuit that made them change their frying oils to oils with less trans fats. And within the next few years, several other popular fast food chains were making the changes as well, including McDonald's, Burger King, Taco Bell, and Wendy's. In 2015, the FDA recognized trans fats as no longer generally recognized as safe, and finally in 2018, the FDA banned the use of trans fats. But as I stated earlier, products can still claim to be free of trans fats if they have less than half a gram per serving. And if you want to take this a step further, in 2023, the World Health Organization called for a total ban of trans fats, with some countries responding a bit more proactively than others. Currently, the battle against trans fats is ongoing, but it does seem to be one where we're actually winning. So with all the recent regulations in place, where do you find trans fats now? As I said, many foods are still very commonly trying to sneak in as much trans fats as possible, with the most common culprits being margarine, shortening, baked goods like cakes and cookies, fried foods like fries, chicken, and fish, certain vegetable oils, microwave popcorn, frozen pizza, refrigerated dough, non-dairy coffee creamer, fish sticks, certain nut butters, potato chips, pie crust, frosting, pancake and waffle mix, breakfast sandwiches, processed meats, certain crackers, certain chilies, and frozen dinners. Basically just stop and think of any place where a company could save money by replacing a little bit of a different kind of fat with trans fats. I'm not saying these foods always have trans fats, but it never hurts to check the ingredients for evidence of hydrogenation. So are trans fats just universally bad, or are there any exceptions to all of this? Well, there may be one. Earlier in the video I mentioned that trans fats are rarely natural. However, there is one type of fatty acid that falls under the definition of trans fats that occurs entirely without human involvement. They're called ruminant trans fats, and they occur naturally in meat and dairy from ruminant animals, like cows, sheep, buffalo, goats, deer, and elk, which have a unique digestive system that makes these ruminant trans fats via bacterial metabolism of mainly polyunsaturated fats. The most well-known ruminant trans fat is called conjugated linoleic acid. There are several studies that link CLA to human fat loss and to a lesser extent increased athletic performance and a decreased risk of inflammation in certain cancers. Now there are also several studies that say that none of this is consistent. But from what I found, there is little evidence of negative effects of natural CLA, at least in reasonable amounts. 
The benefits of CLA are also really only notable from grass-fed animals. Of course, then humans, being the stupidest species on the planet, tried to recreate CLA from vegetable oils and put it in supplement form, which kinda misses the whole point. And these CLA supplements do have much stronger links to inflammation and liver issues, not just because they come in much larger quantities than your typical steak or glass of milk, but also because they have a completely different chemical structure. One that is, once again, not conducive for human consumption. The point is, ruminant trans fats may or may not be a great weight loss help like they're marketed to be, but as long as they're natural, they are a seemingly harmless breath of fresh air compared to all the rest. And there you have it, another killer that has been caught and turned in. And as I said earlier, trans fats seem to be a battle that we're actually winning at the moment, but that's no reason to be complacent. The more you understand what, where, how, and most importantly, why you eat the things that you eat, the better off you're going to be. Now, if you enjoyed the video, or at the very least learned a little something, I encourage you to subscribe because I've got plenty more nutrition videos on the way. I did a video over added sugars with this exact same format that if you haven't checked out, I encourage you to do so. Go ahead and leave down in the comments whatever nutrients or topics you believe deserve an entire in-depth breakdown video like this. And remember that all I ask is that you advocate for your body. You only get the one.